Okay, well, let's get started again. Uh, any questions before we go on? Anybody still having any problems with their model? Again, the solution is floating around. If you still, if you need it, um, you can have that. It's right up here. So just let me know. Uh, but at this point, now we've got a working financial model, and now we can use that, or a portion of that, to help figure out what we think we can sell the company for at the end of our year five holding period. All right, so that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to go back to the source and use tab, and I need to model what my exit or my sale value of this company is going to look like at the end of 2013. All right, so. As we talked about in our, um, in our instructions, the, closing, the projected closing date of the sale, we're going to assume it to be at the end of 2013, so we'll say 12-31-13. Actually, this A1, A31 shouldn't be, it should be 2013 EBITDA, not 2012. But at any rate, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our forecasted exit value based on a multiple of the then LTM EBITDA, which would be 2013 EBITDA. Okay, so what we're going to do, 2013 EBITDA, we're going to pick that up from the model. And that's going to be cell M25 from our model tab. 2013 EBITDA is estimated to be 76.6 million. Okay, so we link to cell M25 on the model tab, 76.6 million. And our multiple, we're going to assume we can exit at the same multiple we buy in at. So I'm just going to link that up above to B7. Kind of a simplistic assumption, but at the end of the day, we're not assuming really incre any increase in value based on a higher multiple than what we're buying at. All right, so we're not assuming we can buy at six and sell at eight. The only difference in value is really going to come from the increasing EBITDA over that five-year period. We're going to multiply that by the same multiple, and that's our exit. The market was starting to heat up, and you thought there might be some kind of depression. Mm -hmm. And it could be. I mean, we could, this is just one assumption. We could assume that we're buying low and we can sell higher. Right, and that's obviously going to have a much more positive impact on our returns if all other things are held equal. Or we could assume that maybe if we want to run a very conservative case, we'll run it at a lower multiple. One of the things we do we'll do later when we get in and I show you how to do an LBO valuation is we'll model it for a couple different scenarios. We'll model it for this base case at six times. I'll model it under a downside assumption that we can only sell at five and a half. And I'll model it in an upside assumption, assuming we can sell at six and a half. Okay, but yes, I mean, we could have all different types of assumptions here. It's really going to depend on what we believe the market's going to look like in five years. So at this point, if we've got our LTM EBITDA, we've got our exit multiple. If we multiply the two, that will tell us what the implied enterprise value or the implied transaction value will be at the end of 2013. In other words, we expect that we can sell this company for $459.5 million at the end of 2013, based on the assumptions we've made. And just like our example of the house yesterday, when we sell the asset, first thing we've, we need to do is we need to pay down our, any debt that's outstanding against that. And so in this cell A, or B34, I want to say minus sum, left parenthesis. Then I want to go to my model tab, and I want to capture the debt that's outstanding at the end of 2013 sells M73 to M76 <coughs> on the model tab. My revolver, my term loan, my senior bonds, my unsecured notes with warrants. Just 186.6 million. Again, make sure you say minus sum. I want this to show as a negative to be consistent with how I've labeled the row over here. Then if there's any cash in the company at that point, that's something that can come back to us. I believe cash ends up being, actually cash ends up being 21.1 million. We want to say equals M47 on the model tab. All right, so when the buyer buys the company, they can turn around and give us that $21.1 million of cash back. 
that flows to equity. And if you look at these labels here, we're basically just walking backward through that total enterprise value formula to figure out what's going to be left over for equity. That's the most important number at the end of the day. We need to know what, com what can come back to us. What's the take? What's the pot look like at the end of the day? All right, so we, get, we sell the company at 459.5. We refin or we take out, we pay back the debt. We take out the cash. But we also have to pay fees. So like anything else, any transaction is going to involve some fees. And if we look at footnote one, <coughs> down here in row 44, it says for our fees, we're going to assume 1% of the purchase price is a banking fee. That is, we're going to pay that to the bank we engage to represent the company for M&A, to sell the company. We're going to pay 1% to our bankers, plus another $2 million to the lawyers and the accountants and everyone else associated with the, or involved in the transaction. And also, we've let, we've set this up to say less transaction fees, so I want this to show up as a negative. So my formula should be minus 0 0.01, 1%, times my transaction value, or B33. Minus two, that two million in legal and other costs. Right, so all these fees taken together should be expressed as a negative. Again, minus 0 0.01 times our transaction value, minus another two million. And when you add all of those up, it should be minus, it should be 6.6 .6 million of fees in total. Make sure you get your signs in there correctly. Now that we have all of those numbers, if we add those together, transaction value, less total debt, plus cash, minus transaction fees, if we sum those up, if we take the sum of B33 to B36, that tells us that the implied value remaining for the equity holders is 287.3 million. This isn't necessarily, this isn't our take though. All right, remember, in order to do this deal, we had to give up 5% in the form of a warrant to the unsecured note holder, so they've become a 5% equity holder in the company. So now the last step here is we need to split that 287.3 among ourselves as the private equity firm or the sponsor and the MES fund that put in that unsecured note with warrants. We took all that risk by taking pick interest, by being unsecured, being at the very bottom of the, of the debt stack. Okay, so the first thing we need to do, percent equity to the sponsor or to us is going to be equal to minus, or one minus that warrant, or K20. One minus K20, or 95%. So if we multiply our equity value, B37 times R%, percent, 95%, and B38, that says that of that 287.3, 95% of it, or 272.9 million, comes back to us. And then the percent equity to the unsecured note holder, we'll say equals K20. That's where we've specified their 5% warrant. And if we multiply 287.3 times 5%, it tells us that 14.4 million goes back to the unsecured note holder in addition to their principal, in addition to their interest, that they got paid back when we took out the total debt. All right, well at this point, we now know what all of our cash flows are. We know what we're putting into the deal, we know what we're getting out of the deal. And because we know those things, now we can run a returns analysis, both for ourselves, as the private equity firm, we can also run it for the unsecured lender. We're not gonna do it for the other lenders because they're just getting their interest, they're just getting their principal. Their IRR is equal to their interest rate for the other lenders. So we don't need to run a returns analysis for them. We'll run it for the unsecured lender because they get their interest, they get their principal, but then they get a little something more in the form of that warrant. That warrant ends up being worth 14.4 million. So their return <coughs> is going to be slightly higher than their stated interest rate of 10%. We'll get to that in a moment. But the first thing we're going to do, <coughs> we need to measure our own returns. And the way we do this <coughs> is we're basically going to calculate our cash flows every year as the sponsor. 
What do we put in at the beginning? What do we get each year in the interim? What do we get out at the end? And once we have those cash flows totaled, Excel has some nice functionality that will allow us to automatically calculate or quickly calculate the internal rate of return on the deal. All right. So the first thing we need to do for, your, or for time zero, 12-31-2008, which is the day we close or we're expecting to close this transaction, <coughs> we need to enter our initial equity investment. And we need to enter this, all of these cash flows will be entered as either a cash inflow or a cash outflow from our perspective as the investor. So day one, we put 104 million into the deal, that needs to be treated as a cash outflow from us. It needs to be shown as a negative. So at time zero, I'm going to say minus F22. My first cash flow, my initial equity investment is minus 104. <coughs> Don't hard code this. Make sure we link, right? Because as the deal terms change, if our amount of equity required changes, we want that to automatically update down here, and drive our returns analysis. So do not hard code that. And in years 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, as we stated before, we're not going to be putting any additional money into the deal. So all we're going to do, we're going to actually zero those out. We can hard code these. Enter those as zero. We'll also do the same thing for dividends. We're not taking any dividends as part of this deal. Now sometimes the sponsor might be able to withdraw some cash from the company every year. Usually the lenders are going to have a say as to whether that can happen. That'll be specified typically in the loan docs, the loan documents for the deal. The lender will say you can either take distributions or not. It's going to be up to us generally as the lender. <coughs> and most, you know, like I said, most deals, if they're getting done, are getting done on pretty strict terms. So dividends, if deals are getting done right now, chances are sponsors are not getting paid dividends. That is, they're not taking cash out of the company each year. In this case, we're assuming zero for dividends, so we'll just zero those out. And our proceeds at sale really only apply in that very last year. We're not selling the company until year five, so these first five cells should be zeroed out. And in that last cell, we want to reflect this 272.9 272.9 million of proceeds that we calculated earlier, our take. So we want to say equals B39 in that last year. Now what we're going to do is just sum up each column. We'll copy that across. When you paste it, paste special formulas. If you don't, you'll lose that border on the right side. So Alt-E-S-F to paste, F9 to recalc. We've got a very clean, simple summary of our cash flows in all of these periods. We put in 104 million at closing. We get out 272.9 million at the end of year five. All right, well now that we know those, we can calculate our returns. And there are two ways within Excel that we can do that. And really, it's going to depend on I think what, not really what version of Excel you have, but whether you've enabled a certain add-in that comes with Excel. All right, so one of these, if not both, will work for you. The first one is you enter this just like a sum formula, equals IRR. Then you're going to select the range of your cash flows. In this case, it would be, what is this, E33 to J33. And then typically you'll enter some guess, a random numerical number. Enter one, enter 10, enter 1,000, it doesn't matter. But just give Excel some guess formula or some guess to put in. And actually when you start typing IRR, you hit enter or you hit your left parenthesis, it will specify what data it needs. Okay, so I typed in equals IRR, left parenthesis, now the 
it's, uh, it says values in bold, basically telling me the next thing I need to input should be the values, my cash flows. I select those, comma one, my guess. When you hit enter, you should get a return, an IRR of 21.3%. Right? That works in this case, but it's not the preferred way I like to calculate an internal rate of return. The reason why is the IRR formula implicitly assumes that every cash flow in your model is precisely one year apart from the prior year's cash flow. In reality, we know that that, in many cases, doesn't happen. And we might get some cash on December 31st of one year, and then you know, maybe we can take a dividend at, say, June 30th, six months later. Well, IRR returns are strongly dependent upon timing, upon when those cash flows are realized. Think of the time value of money. Think of the discounted cash flow, how far back we're discounting cash flows has an impact on what the present value is. Right. And there's another formula in Excel that actually takes into account the exact timing of the cash flows. It's a very similar formula. It's called XIRR. And I would use this, provided you've got the add-in enabled on your computer. And some of you may, some of you may not. You'll know right away if you try and use this formula and you get an error, they'll tell you that the add-in's not enabled. Just use this, and I'll show you how to enable that at the end of class. Right. But XIRR, range of your cash flows, comma, and then you'll enter your range of dates. Right. As I mentioned in an earlier class, Excel has the ability to calculate the number of days between dates. So by entering the range of dates, Excel can take into account the precise timing at which those cash flows occur. And in most situations, again, these happen to be a year apart, so IRR works. But in many situations, cash flows will be a little lumpy. You might get some cash on December 31st, then no cash the next December 31st, then you might take a dividend the following March 30th, etc. And XIRR is better, better equipped to handle that. So XIRR, range of my values, E33 to J33, comma, range of my dates, E29 to J29. Hit enter, and I get the same number. But if those dates changed, you'd see a change in the IRR. Does everyone understand the difference? I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say in um, 2013, instead of selling it December 31st, we sell it June 30th. If I change that date to June 30th, F9 to recalc, you see that my IRR has actually gone up. I got that cash. That 272 million, I got it six months sooner. Cash today is worth more than cash tomorrow, so that drives a higher return. But if I use just an IRR formula, there'd be no change, because IRR is implicitly assumes one year difference in all our cash flows. All right, so we've basically finished our model from the sponsor's perspective. We've gone through, we've created our source and use, our pro forma balance sheet, we modified our model, we modeled our exit, we calculated our cash flows, we got down to a return of 21.3%. Question now is, is it good enough? Is 21.3% enough to justify our doing the deal, our managing the deal, our being involved in helping the company strategically over the next five years, all the management time and effort it's going to take, Will this give us enough of a return to justify all that time and effort and risk associated with the deal? And really, it depends on what our hurdle rate is. If our hurdle rate is 15%, this is probably a pretty good looking deal for us. If our hurdle rate is 20%, it's, it's probably okay, but a little bit of a slip in the performance of the company or maybe the economy goes into the tank, a little bit of a slip, and maybe now all of a sudden our returns are underwater. And now we're just working to preserve capital. Now we're just working you know, to get a very low level return. We won't ever get to the carried interest level. And that's what general partners want. They want to get that carried interest. That's where they make their money, as we talked about yesterday. 
So if a GP, if a general partner in a private equity firm is knocking the cover off the ball, that is they're doing deals with a 21.3% of return, <coughs> rate of return when their hurdle is only 15%, they're taking home a lot of cash. <coughs> If our hurdle rate's 22%, though, we're probably never going to get to the carried interest level. Our returns are going to be pretty mediocre. Does that make sense? So at the end of the day, it becomes a judgment call. And usually it's not such a clear-cut situation where it's, you look at it and the numbers are just so far above the hurdle rate, it's a can't-miss can't deal. Usually there's going to be some sensitivity involved in the modeling. We'll go back, we'll run a best, an upside case, we'll run a downside case, we'll run some cases in an increasing interest rate environment, maybe a decreasing rate environment. And we'll try and really dig into the model and help understand the risks associated with this deal. It's usually not just a go or no go decision. It's usually not that easy. This is like dollar size back into the decision? Um, well, it, it will. You know, a, a, a private equity fund, take Blackstone for example, I think their last fund before the, you know, before the music stopped, so to speak, last year, I think their last fund was like 20 billion. Right. So they, <coughs> they need to get that money invested as quickly as possible. Get it out in the market, get it working, so that they can start, so they can start selling investments, realizing cash returns, and get back to raising their next fund. In private equity, it is, to an extent, it's all about getting that money deployed, turning it over, getting back out to the market and raising more funds. Because if you can imagine, a firm like Blackstone, if they've got a $20 billion fund and they're taking a one, one and a half, two percent management fee on that, that's real money. Okay. There's a reason, you know, they were excited to get to 20 billion. One percent on 20 billion is a lot bigger than one percent on five billion. And so private equity firms, they want to turn their money over as quickly as they can, get back to the market, raise ever bigger and bigger funds to drive those management fees. Those management fees come in, and private equity firms are pretty small. They're not, you know, for the most part, they're not firms with thousands of bodies around that need to get paid. Usually it's a small group of very highly compensated, highly skilled people running that private equity firm, serving as the GP on deals, and splitting those management fees. So 1% of 20 billion splits really well among, say, 30, 40, 50, even 100, a couple hundred partners, as the case may be. Uh, so private equity firms intentionally limit their size. They try and get bigger dollar amounts. When they get bigger dollars under management, they have to do bigger deals. Right, so a deal like this where they're only putting a, 100 million in probably isn't very economical for a Blackstone if they've got a $20 billion fund. You've got to do a lot of $100 million deals to get fully invested. And it's kind of a paradox of private equity. As you get bigger, you have to look at bigger and bigger deals. And there are so ma only so many of those out there. There are only so many lenders that are going to be willing to step up and fund those big deals, too. So there are probably some theoretical limits as to how big private equity can get. Now, the MES fund is going to be set up probably pretty similar. You know, they invest at a different level of the capital stack. They take on different levels of risk than the equity investors. So they probably have a different required rate of return. But at the end of the day, their decision-making process is going to be similar. Do our returns exceed our hurdles? Does it make sense for us to do the deal, to take on the risk, have our money deployed for five years? Is it going to lead to us getting highly compensated at the end of the day? So a MES lender is going to run the same type of returns analysis. So their initial loan will be that first cash flow. They're putting in $60 million at time zero. They're not putting in, they're not ponying up any additional cash the next five years, just at time zero. Okay, they receive no cash interest at 123108. 123108 is just a split second in time. That's the closing table. That's when the deal gets closed. We will even though they're not getting cash interest in this model, we will link to the cash interest line in our debt schedule to our model. Just in case the terms change at some point, we'd want that to automatically flow in. So we're going to link to I-150 for year one. Copy that across, paste special formulas to paste. 
So again, it's zero in every period. The first zero at 12.31.08 or time zero is a hard-coded zero. The others are linked to the cash interest line in our model. Principal repayment at sale. First five periods are zero, right? Because they're not getting paid their principal until the very end, until the company is sold, until the remaining debt gets taken out. Their principal is part of this 186.6 that we modeled over here. But we'll also pull this from the model. So we'll say equals at 96.6 million, which is in cell M148 in the model tab. And then also at 1231, they get that warrant. Or they get that warrant cashed out, rather. Which we've already calculated the value of that. It's in B42, it's that 14.4 million. So as I said a moment ago, they're going to get something more than just their interest and their principal repaid. They're going to get that warrant value at the end as well. And if we sum up their cash flows just like we did for the private equity firm in each year, we can now calculate a return for the MES lender using that same XIRR function specifying our cash flows first, then specifying our date range second. And when we hit enter, we should get a return of 13.1%. So something north of their interest rate. Their interest rate was 10%. That warrant in year five, that warrant value in year five bumps their returns up to 13.1%. If there was no warrant, just delete that. Their return is just their interest rate. It's just bond math. Okay, but the decision making process, as I said, very similar. 13.1% is it good enough? If we're the MES lender, does that significantly exceed our return hurdle? If our return hurdle is 15%, then we're not priced highly enough. Because 13.1 13 won't cut it. If it's 12%, then maybe it's pretty good. And that's how these lenders, that's how these MES lenders price their money. They've got a target. Just like private equity. If they don't get over and above it, they don't get carry. If they don't get carry, then they're spending a lot of time and effort to get pretty meager returns. All right, and the next thing I want to do, I'm going to do it up here. You don't have a space for it yet in your model. So now I'm going to show you how to do this, how to use this type of model as a fourth valuation methodology. All right, so really what I want you to do is follow along with what I'm doing on the screen, understand the concept, and then at the end of the class, if you want a copy of it, I'll give it to you, um, and you can have it for yourself. But this is kind of a difficult exercise to follow along with um, in Excel. We're basically going to work backward all the way through the model, through the, through the exit, through the source and use, all the way back and try and figure out what a private equity fund, the maximum that they could be willing to pay given a finite universe of assumptions. This is an exercise that we might use if we're an investment banker, we're representing a company in an M&A scenario and we're trying to answer the question, what might the company be worth to a financial buyer, to a private equity firm, given a certain state of the capital markets given a um, set required rate of return for that private equity firm, et cetera. Does that make sense? It's kind of an interesting exercise that as a banker we could use this if we know, if we've got some really good information as to things like how much debt would be available to do a leveraged buyout on this type of company, if we know who the likely financial sponsors are out there that might do this deal, if we know what their required rates of return are, it can give us a good sense for what is the maximum they can be willing to pay. And obviously, if we have an idea of that, it's pretty useful in, at a negotiating table, right? If you know what the other party can pay, then it helps to know how far that you can push them in the negotiations. So that's probably a scenario in which this would be useful or could be useful in the real world. What we're going to do 
And as I scroll down below in my model, again, you don't have this. You shouldn't have this at this point in your model. Is I've got a valuation template that we've created. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run three general scenarios on the exit. I'm going to run a base case on my exit, assuming something similar to what I assumed over here. I'm going to assume that as my base case, my most likely case, this company should be able to be sold for six times EBITDA at the end of year five. And then as we talked about a moment ago, I'm going to run a downside case where maybe the world's not going to look as, as rosy as we think it will sitting here at time zero. Maybe this company can only be sold for five and a half times. Then we're going to run an upside case. Maybe it can be sold for six and a half times. Within each, each of those three scenarios, I'm going to run three additional scenarios to sell for what three different or a range of private equity buyers might be willing to pay if they've got a certain specified range of return requirements. That'll become more clear when we get into it. But that's basically the outline for what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start with my base case. And as we talked about before, my base case is going to involve a multiple of six times. That is, I think, most likely the end of year five, I can sell this, or a, an owner of this company could, be, could sell the company for six, six times EBITDA, which if we multiply that by EBITDA at the end of year five, gives us what should be a familiar value, 459.5 million. This first section here in my base case is going to mimic what I did over here. It's only once we do three additional cases within this base case that you're going to start to see some divergence and start to see a range of values starting to emerge. All right, so I multiply that by 76.6. And another implicit assumption here is that we, we buy the projections, that we really believe that most likely the company will be generating EBITDA of 76.6 million by the end of year 5-2. There are a number of assumptions we have to make, and you'll see those play out. But that's one of them. Okay, if we add back cash in 2013, we subtract debt. Notice as I go through here, I'm, I'm locking on a lot of these cells because I'm ultimately going to have to copy them. My transaction fees are uh, minus 0 0.01 times my enterprise value, minus 2, which would give me, also not surprising, a, an implied equity value of 287.3. I multiply that by my take, 95%. It gives me that 272.9. Now this 95%, of course, rests on the assumption that a capital structure similar to what we've explored above would be available to purchase this company. All right, that is, we could raise so much debt, and as part of that, we'd have to give up a 5% warrant. Does that make sense? And that's something our leveraged finance group probably be able to tell us if we're an investment bank. We've got a lev fin group. We can take a look at this deal. Say, OK, a company in this industry packaged foods you, know, you should be able to get four and a half times leverage. A debt package is going to be structured roughly like this. You're probably going to have to go to a MES piece. And as part of that MES piece, you're probably going to have to give up a 5% warrant. Right? It's an assumption. Okay, whether it's actually true or not is you know, kind of neither here nor there. But it's whatever we believe is most likely. All right, so we know what our, our exit could look like under a base case scenario. Next thing I want to do is specify three different required rates of return. Basically a range of required rates of return. And this could be, you know, I'm setting it up so it's, it ranges anywhere between 20, 15% uh, and 25% with kind of an average or, you know, middle value of 20%. I could have these vary by less, have them vary by more. I think 15 to 25 roughly encapsulates the world of private equity required rates of return. It's probably even a little tighter than that, to be honest, but I think it's pretty a pretty good rough approximation. And if we know, if we believe that that value to the sponsor could be 272.9 million at the end of year five, the question becomes, 
what would a private equity buyer, what, was, what, what would be the most that they could pay for that stream of cash flows at time zero? And at this point, it's really just doing some math, solving using the time value of money. For a given rate of return, here, if we go over here, put the time value of money formula back on the board, we take a present value, we multiply by one plus a rate, raise that to the nth power, gives us a future value at time n. Okay, well here, we've got an idea of what that future value can be. It's our exit value, or the value that would flow back to the sponsor after we exit. So if I do some math, solve for present value, if I take my future value time n, divided by one plus my required rate of return, raised to the nth power, n being five in this case, I can solve for what that initial equity investment should be. So the math is, if I take my uh, <coughs> value at the end of time t5, divided by one plus my rate, raised to the fifth power, tells me that private equity buyers with this required rate of return and this cash flow at the end of year five would be willing to pay no more than these amounts at time zero. And not surprisingly, the private equity firm with the highest required rate of return can put the least amount of money into the deal and still meet their re required return hurdle. Does that make sense? Their money is more expensive than the other you know, two private equity firms, if we assume this is just three firms. You can typically find out a lot about private equity firms if you can get your hands on their prospectus, their PPM. It will tell you what their waterfall structure looks like. It will tell you generally where the breaks are, and you can figure out what those required rates of return are for the PE firm. It's really what is the point at which or after which the cash flows start to flow heavily back to the general partner. That'll give you a sense of where that, where that return hurdle is. Maybe it's 15, maybe it's 18, maybe it's 20, 25. If you can figure that out with certainty, it, again, it can be really powerful in backing into the maximum that they'd be willing to pay. All right. Now, if we add in the transaction debt, <coughs> that is our total debt up here, the amount of debt that's going to be available, to do the deal, if we add in the cash used for purchase, it's zero here, that would give us implied total consideration at closing in each case. And again, the higher the return requirement, the lower they can pay, the lower they can value that company at at closing. Now, if I change that 20%, to 21.3, recalculate it, you'll see that the numbers start to look pretty similar to what our base case looks like. Right? Because this deal at the base case is valued at 20, or has a return of 21.3, gives us roughly a <coughs> transaction value very similar to what we saw before. All right, now if we look at debt that would get refinanced, what we're doing is we're basically walking backward through the sources table, backward through the uses table, trying to figure out what the implied enterprise value of the deal could be at, at year one. Subtract transaction fees. Okay, we're walking backward through our uses table. Now we're implying what that equity value would be, what that implied equity value would be at closing. We buy the company. And now if we just add back debt and take out cash on the balance sheet, it'll give us the implied enterprise value. As of time zero. This analysis is a little, um, doesn't always make a whole lot of sense the first time you see it. This is something you're probably going to have to look at a few times and kind of analyze and, and get comfortable with. It's a very um, sort of an iterative type of approach to get back to what that initial enterprise value can be. Right, but if we get back to that point, we've basically walked all the way back. If we look at that relative to 
EBITDA in year one and give us a sense for what those implied EBITDA multiples can be. So what this is telling us is that a buyer with a 25% required rate of return, this is the maximum they're going to be willing to pay at time zero. So if we have, an, if we have a sense of what those buyers' required rates of return are, we have a sense for what type of capital is available in the marketplace for deals like this. And if we have a good sense for what that exit can be on the back end, we can know who we can push and how far we can push them in negotiations. And ideally, we know this with a lot more certainty for each individual private equity buyer we might be talking to. Okay, well, we can also do this Again, we can do this on a downside case. Okay, and obviously on a downside case, if the exit value is worth less, if there's less cash at the end, they're probably going to be willing to pay less for it in the beginning. So these valuations tend to be lower. The valuation for the 15% PE firm is going to be lower in a 5.5 times exit than it will be in a six times exit. All right, so each corresponding value would be lower. And the opposite would hold true for our upside case. So if we take this, if we assume we can exit at six and a half times instead, obviously these are going to imply correspondingly higher values. And we can look at those as, you know, in terms of total enterprise value at time zero. We can look at those as a multiple of EBITDA, but it'll give us a sense of what the range of values could be in a potential LBO transaction. This can actually, like I said before, can serve as a, as a fourth valuation methodology.